Today I'm at the Southside uh, Community Arts Center, and today I'm going to interview uh, multimedia artist, artist Makiba Kadeem Dubos, and uh, hopefully she'll give us some insight and share some of her story so we can have a better understanding not only of her work and creative process, but just about the life of an artist. So uh, thanks for doing this, Makiba, and um, you know, this is going to be very helpful for us, you know, not only for us, but for a lot of other people. So uh, the first thing I want to ask you, though, is um, something about you growing up, your background, and when did you first get interested in art? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, I've always known that I was an artist, and I know that may sound cliche, but seriously, I always knew. Uh, I had an aunt who was very talented, mm -hmm. you know, she never really considered herself an artist, but she was a very creative person. She liked to sew, she liked to paint, she did all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in that environment. I was raised by my maternal grandmother, mm -hmm. and um, you know, during the time that I was growing up, considering a career as an artist was not something that you did, you know. My grandmother was very old school and she was just like, no, honey, go to the secretarial school. You Get know, a paying so job, like, right? <laughs> and I was like, no, mama, I, I have to do this. You don't understand. It's just, it's, it's just calling me. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to be a nun, believe it or not. Uh, interesting, yeah. <laughs> I grew up in the Catholic Church. Uh, I no longer am a member of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and I was mentored by a Jesuit priest. Now, it's interesting that he was a Jesuit priest because they're the bad boys of the, the Catholic Church. Right. <laughs> you know, they're the rebels, they're the mavericks of the Catholic Church. And under uh, Father Hassey, his name was Father James Hassey's tutelage, um, I learned to be free with my art. He did not, um, he did not allow boundaries, you know, he was mm -hmm. just like, do it, just do it, do whatever you feel, you know, and we'll deal with it later. Mm -hmm. So uh, one day he was watching me drawing little pictures. I was in, probably in second or third grade and I was drawing pictures of people um, on roller skates, but instead mm -hmm. of the roller skates having wheels, there were little bugs on the skates carrying the people around. And he came over, he looked at it and he had this perplexed look on his face and he said, he said, I think you got something. He said, we can, you belong in the master's class. You know? <laughs> and that was it from that day on. He just kind of took me under his wing. He did exhibitions at Loyola University, which I believe was his alma mater. Mm -hmm. And he would occasionally put some of my work into his shows. Yeah, yeah you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that you were raised by your maternal grandmother. Yes. Um, how did she influence, or at all, you know, your work, your art, or your desire or your creative process? Well, I can say my grandmother was a very strong woman. She was the matriarch of our family. Mm -hmm. When she passed away, everything kind of fell apart. The family uh, unit, you know, dissipated. Uh, my grandmother, though she never spoke about it, she did some things that were interesting, like she kept bones from chickens and she burnt candles and you know things that I didn't see in other people's houses were happening in my house mm -hmm. and my grandmother would say tomorrow it is gonna snow to the top of the door tops for my birthday and lo and behold we'd wake up and what she said would be <laughs> she would dream she knew um, when people were pregnant family members or close friends, she would dream about fish and tell them, it's you. She didn't even have to guess about it. Wow. So she was a very powerful woman. You know, she had a lot of strength and power. Yeah, now so, where was she from now? She was from Alabama, um, and uh, my grandfather, who she was married from, was Creole from New Orleans. And um, she uh, had four daughters. My mother was the oldest, and mm -hmm. I'm my mother's oldest. Okay, that's a pretty interesting background you got, you know, the rural South, and of course with uh, Louisiana, it's a little different twist on the rural South, and I'm sure, no doubt, that's played a, a, a role in your, your creative process and your aesthetic choices. Absolutely, and my father, we haven't even gotten into that, my, my father uh, is... Uh, I would say priest, but that's not correct. Reverend, he is ordained, but that came later. But he runs a monastic community, has an ashram in the uh, 
the mountains in the uh, Ozark Mo Mountains oh, in Arkansas, but they were in New Orleans for many, many years. And just before Katrina happened, I remember my dad said, it's time to get out of here. Something's coming and I have to go. So my father had that gift mm -hmm. also. And uh, he had seven wives at one time. My mother wow. wasn't one of them. I was his oldest child. My mother was like, no, got that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's very interesting. You know, before we came up here, I was, of course, you know, I was down there looking at your work. And that's what attracted me because I said, well, it has some interesting stories. And I know she's got some interesting things to say about it. So, um, you know, that being said, there are two works in particular I want to ask you about. Okay. The first one is Fire Woman. Okay. Uh, of course, it's like it's multimedia, three-dimensional type things. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, the genesis of that, that thought, that creative thought and impulse. Well, I have to tell you, most of my paintings began without any particular outcome in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but Fire Woman uh, manifested itself, or Shango manifested herself or himself as Fire Woman in my work. Uh, I just recognized that somewhere along the line, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Shango in there. The, you know, the metal piece that's like an act, double-headed axe, you know, it, it's Shango. And that's how it became Fire Woman. Yeah. Well, so, it always was. Yeah. So now know. in that particular piece, um, of course, it, it's, it's not just a two-dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like, in, you know, just observing your work, you tend to want to like mix dimensions and whatnot. Is it any particular uh, reason that you do that or other than of course you're expressing yourself? Well if, if, if you, um, if anyone were familiar with my earlier work, it was mm -hmm. very flat. I am a s strong colorist. That was always my most prominent mm -hmm. gift as mm -hmm. an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, after attending design school, I'm studying interior design. I'm seven semesters into that. Mm -hmm. Though I really don't believe I'll ever become an interior <laughs> designer. I, it's almost like going to architectural sure. school, and that's totally yeah. not me. So um, taking 2D and 3D classes and other art classes that I had not formally taken because I did not go to college first, I just dived into a career as a visual artist because I knew that was what I wanted to do, and I kicked down doors, basically, because nobody, you know, I remember being turned away, turned away by Nicole Gallery, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And then finally, one day, she said, you know what, I'm going to give you a show because you're one of the most, you are the most persistent artist I've ever met in my life. So I would have to say that uh, design school has had a very strong impact on my work, mm -hmm. uh, more rec my more recent work, and it's added that element of dimension dimensionality to mm -hmm. it. Uh, I've studied relief sculpture and 2D design and 3D design as I mentioned. Very interesting. Earlier. Yeah, it's very, very, uh, you know, it's exciting work. It, that's what grabbed my attention. I said, I have to talk to this lady, <laughs> you know, and of course you've already given me some clues. You, you mentioned, of course, with the uh, Fire Woman, you talked about Shango. Mm -hmm. And of course we know that's a West African icon mm -hmm. and whatnot. So do you tend to uh, use, you know, social kind of iconography to, you know, to, to, um, to include in your work? Oh, I always have. Yeah. I always have. Uh, Dio Laoye downstairs. Uh, he uh, actually has collected several pieces of my work over the years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've always enjoyed is Dio's feedback on my work because he always recognizes um, mm -hmm. the symbolism that mm -hmm. I use. It's not always like right in your face. It's right. like little things that, you know, only someone who knows to look for it will mm -hmm. know that it's there, which is a good thing as an artist because you, you don't really want to turn people off, but you also have to do what you feel. Right. And some people will be turned off by my work, but that's really not my problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Because you have to be true to your own artistic expression, Absolutely. to your own imperative and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, you also have another work down there I thought was kind of interesting, the Story Pot mm -hmm. work. T talk to us about that one. The story pot is uh, somewhat of a journey through, uh, and actually, my really good friend, my best friend, actually, uh, um, in Mashani Lanfair, who is also an artist, she um, she named that piece. Oh. You know, I sent her the image. I was like, "Look at this! I don't know where this came from." At all. <laughs> and she said, "Oh my gosh!" She's like, 
like story pot. She's like, it's like your phoenix rising from the ashes or something. And, and that was exactly what I was feeling when I was creating that piece. Mm -hmm. It was all about having, you know, the process of my divorce and my daughter was taken from me. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I still have like 50-50 right. visitation right. custody type thing with her. But um, it was a very devastating thing for me. And uh, I didn't paint for about two or three years. Wow. Yeah, and then all of a sudden the floodgates opened and I was able to... So all this burst, creativity burst through. Yes. Because it probably was dammed up and you mm -hmm. probably needed to do that, otherwise you... One of my um, regulations that I set on myself is that I do not want to paint uh, negative work. I mm -hmm. don't want to paint things that, uh, that project ugliness, mm -hmm. you know. So I sort of did not allow myself to create during that time because my feelings were very bitter and ugly during oh, that time. Yeah. And I said, I do not want that to be represented. You didn't want to put that into the world. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank you for that then because a lot of people, you know, lash out, act out and mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, yeah. So, so, you know, you have this internal guidance mechanism, no, no doubt. And of course, the quality of the work you got down there, you know, it's really, it's really exciting. Thank you. You know, it's really exciting. Um, I noticed too in that particular work, the story pie, and of course we talked about symbolism and whatnot. And of course in some of your other work, and of course with the organization I'm with, a lot of times we see the, the, the symbol of um, the rooster. Mm -hmm. Very powerful symbol in Yoruba culture. Mm -hmm. And so talk to us about, you know, your interpretation of that and your inclusion of that, that particular symbol in your work. Well, I have to tell you, mm -hmm. um, Throughout much of my adult life, I have always lived at a cross road, <laughs> mm -hmm. literally. Okay. Uh, apartments, homes, wherever I've lived, it's always been where two streets intersect. So I've always mm -hmm. had this connection to the crowd, crossroads energy, el agua, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, it's always sort of popped up in my art in some form mm -hmm. or another, sometimes without me even intentionally putting it right. there. Uh, particularly uh, Story Pot and uh, Crossing the Road, uh, that whole series in 1808 was when I lived in my home with uh -huh. my uh, soon-to-be ex-husband. I um, Down the street from us there was a Mexican family who lived on the corner and they had this lush garden mm -hmm. and one day I'm looking into the garden and there's a rooster in their yard uh. in, in the city. <laughs> this was in, right in Right. In the middle of the city. Yeah. And it was the most beautiful rooster and they lived on the crossroad. Uh, and uh, so that, that symbol just kept coming back into my work because uh, I know that you can't get anywhere without going through El Agua. So That's right. We well, go. you know, I guess as you were talking there, I kind of like had the thought that in some ways maybe that was a culture memory. Absolutely. That you were accessing, you know, with those specific kind of symbols. Yes. You know, and, and, it, and it shows. Yeah, being raised Catholic, you know, <laughs> and not really uh, knowing a lot about my, you know, my ancestral path, mm -hmm. uh, except for, you know, uh, my watching my grandmother and observing her mm -hmm. actions and knowing that something was there that mm -hmm. wasn't in, you know, my Catholic upbringing. Right. Though it is. The Catholic Church has a lot of the same symbolisms because they have borrowed them. We will use the word borrowed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, so it was always there. Yeah. You know? But I, I used to have uh, visions, mm -hmm. dream, wake visions and sleeping visions. Uh, and I always knew things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're taught to hush that up and sure. not really tell people about it and consequently what happened is I kind of it's in the background now and I can't summon it up again yeah you know you, you don't really want to talk to everyone about those oh things. absolutely yeah. right you need kind of like permission in a way yeah. to talk about some some of those kinds of things that that's very interesting of course to you know as uh, people of African descent you know in our creative process a lot of times we do hearken these memories, cultural mm -hmm. memories, and sometimes we don't, from what I understand, we don't really know where they come from other than the fact that they resonate with us. Right. You know, me, myself coming from the rural South Mississippi in particular, I can relate to some of the things you were shared about your grandmother or even your, your grandfather mm -hmm. and all of that because that was like part of the background, not 
you know, not really talked about overtly, right. but even if you went to church, you, somebody still drilled a hole in a penny and put it around the baby's neck. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, you know, but, but that's well. Okay, Makiba, so, so going forward, how do you see uh, your, your practice as an artist developing? What do you aspire to going forward? Are you, are you examining any new techniques or methods or how you want to distribute it or share your art? Well, I believe my work will become uh, more 3D, more dimensional, mm -hmm. more hands-on. I've mm -hmm. always loved collaborative projects, mm. and I've also loved projects that were interactive. I'm currently working on a project that I actually have to turn down a residency at the University of Chicago or an opportunity to right, to do it. to uh, submit a full application. I was invited to submit the yeah. full application after my initial uh, um interview or contact. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the uh, requirements was that the artist could not be currently enrolled in a full, in a uh, academic program. So I had to withdraw my application. Wow. But the project that I submitted to them is a project that I've, I'm working on for a show in November at Wamame Gallery with uh, Sapphire and Crystals, mm -hmm. uh, the African American group of uh, female artists okay. that I'm a member of. Um, it, the show is called State of Grace, but it's like grace and race simultaneously. Mm, yeah. um, my portion uh, deals with uh, uh, the effects of domestic violence. Uh, interesting. And I will be telling the stories of uh, survivors of domestic violence, including my own story. So, uh, within, you know, within my divorce. Right, that sounds very powerful. Yeah. So I'll be doing time. portraits of the women, plus telling their story. Literally, it'll be in a binder, and people can open it and read. So it'll be very interactive. Right, and it sounds like it's you know it has a a, a medicinal, a healing mm -hmm. kind of quality to it. Yes, yeah, so a lot of the women who I've been uh, in contact with are people who I did not know previously, mm -hmm. and we've you know kind of made this sort of a sisterhood mm -hmm. I mean we talk to each other all the time now oh, terrific. because we have these similarities in mm -hmm. our lives and our stories and they are just so relieved to actually to be able, able to. to let it out yeah and to let it out in a in a form where people will who, who can where people can appreciate it mm -hmm. as an art form as well as their story of and the the, the series is called tales of woe I like that Tales of Well. Yes. Wow, great. Well, look, I know uh, we're about to run out of time because they're about to close down, but uh, you've given us some very interesting and, and, you know, some really nice little purrs. And, and, and thank you for, uh, you know, giving us a look inside your mind as, a, as, an, as an artist. So um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, maybe not a, just talk to you some more, uh, but even collaborate because, you know, our organization, Your Arts Foundation, we are involved in collaborations of, of different kinds and cultural exchanges. Oh, that would be excellent. Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. So we're going to sign off now. Uh, I wish you well, Makiba. And again, thank you for uh, sharing your insights. Thank you, Oye Okay.